Alrighty, good morning, or good afternoon, or whatever it is. Thank you, Eric. Excuse me, I'm trying to get this thing right. Well, Seattle is about to make history, and the whole world is watching. On April 1st, our minimum wage will rise to $11 an hour, the first step towards a groundbreaking $15 an hour minimum wage. Yep. But weeks, weeks before the first phase in goes into effect, the right wing media is having a cow from Rush Limbaugh to Rupert Murdoch's New York Post. They have already seized upon a handful of unrelated restaurant closures to declare that Seattle's minimum wage is an unmitigated job killer. Here's a spoiler alert. It isn't. To be absolutely clear, many of my fellow capitalists and their surrogates in politics, in the media, in the press, are heavily invested in portraying our $15 minimum wage as an economic disaster. Because 15 represents far more than just a livable wage for fast food workers and others. It is a direct repudiation of the failed economic theory that has been guiding our nation's economic policies for almost four decades a trickle-down agenda of stagnant or falling wages, tax cuts, disinvestment, and economic deregulation that has intentionally benefited the super wealthy like me at the expense of everyone else. From 1950 through the late 1970s, the bottom 90% of households benefited from 70% of national income growth. As the American economy grew, so did the American middle class. But since 1980, when President Reagan ushered in the, tr the era of trickle-down economics, 100% of all growth has gone to just the top 10%. And since 2009, here in Washington state and in 16 other states, 100% of all growth has gone to just the top 1%. From 1950 through 1980, during the greatest economic expansion in human history, corporate profits averaged 6% of GDP. Today, profits consume 12% of GDP, while labor's, labor's share of GDP has fallen by exactly the same amount. That's, by the way, a trillion dollars a year that used to be profits, that, you, that is now profits that used to be wages. And ultimately, all those profits are going into the pockets of shareholders like me in the form of stock buybacks and dividends. There are those who blame the decline of the American middle class on structural changes in the underlying economy, on globalization, new technologies, and other disruptive innovations. But this explanation is disingenuous for in reality, this trillion dollar a year transfer of wealth is a direct result of the economic policies we have chosen to implement in Washington, D.C. and in state capitals throughout our nation. We have chosen to cut taxes on billionaires and millionaires and to deregulate the financial services industry. We have chosen to starve our schools and to saddle our children with $1.2 trillion of student debt. We have chosen to erode the minimum wage and the overtime threshold and the bargaining power of labor. None of this was an accident. These were not unintended consequences. Our crisis of inequality is a deliberate choice, not a bug, but a feature of a failed economic program that has been built upon a fundamentally flawed theory of economic growth. Trickle-down economics tells us that if wages go up, if wages go up, jobs must go down. And that if taxes rise, business investment must fall. Trickle down tells us that if there is an, that, that there is an economic trade-off between fairness and growth. So we chose growth over fairness over the last 30 years, but got neither. But I'm here today to tell you that in the real economy, fairness and growth go hand in hand and to offer a modern theory of growth 
that recognizes the fundamental role of economic inclusion. It is an economic theory based on the empirical truth that in a 21st century technological capitalist economy, growth is a product of the virtuous cycle between innovation and demand, and that, eco and that the economic, political, and social policies that drive both innovation and demand are fundamentally inclusive. And if that sounds like economic heresy, it's because it is. Almost everything you were taught in college about economics is wrong. For the, for the past century, the dominant neoclassical economic paradigm has painted a narrow and mechanistic view of how capitalism works. Focused on the role of markets, prices, and rational self-interested sellers and buyers in so supposedly efficiently allocating resources, sellers maximize profits, buyers maximize utility, prices are set, the market is cleared, and resources are allocated in a socially Pareto optimal way. Driving this allegedly natural and self-regulating process is capital, the defining feature of market capitalism. And, it, and from this neoclassical economic thinking, we derive the trickle-down explanation for how to create growth, make rich people richer. Indeed, the central argument of trickle-down economics is that it is the wealth of the wealthy and the profits of corporations, the concentrated accumulation of capital that is the indispensable prerequisite for growth and prosperity. The richer job creators, the more money they have and the less constrained they are by regulation, the more jobs they create. Simple, persuasive, but wrong. That's because over the past several decades, most of the bedrock assumptions of neoclassical economics have unraveled. Behavioral economics, e economists have accumulated a mountain of evidence showing that real human beings don't actually behave rationally at all. Empirical economists have identified anomalies suggesting that markets aren't actually efficient. And experimental economists have raised problematic questions about the very existence of utility. So humans aren't rational, markets aren't efficient, and there may actually be no such thing as utility. In fact, we now know with scientific certainty that our economies are actually complex adaptive ecosystems that are characterized by the same kinds of feedback loops found in natural ecosystems. Which is why Republicans, and sadly even some progressive economists, are so wrong when they, for example, assert that if wages go up, employment must go down. On the contrary, the fundamental law of, capital, uh, law of capitalism is ecosystemic and speaks to these feedback loops. When workers have more money, businesses have more customers and need more workers. Saying that when wages grow, employment shrinks is like claiming that when plants grow, animals shrink. It is not true. Given that most, thank you. Given that the most fundamental assumptions of conventional economics are mistaken, it should be no surprise that the trickle-down policies based on these neoclassical assumptions have done nothing but make the rich richer. But the most fundamental flaw in the trickle-down theory of growth, the one that has misguided our economic policies for more than three decades, is the previously unchallenged presumption that it is the accumulation of capital that drives our economy. 200 years ago, at the dawn of the Industrial Age, that may have been true, but in the 21st century, where the availability of capital and the cost of innovation have res respectively risen and fallen exponentially, access to capital is no longer the primary constraint on market capitalism. Investors like me are already struggling to cope with what the Bain Company calls capital superabundance. To comprehend the exponential growth of capital, consider that when the S&P 500 was first published back in 1957, its total market capitalization stood at just $172 billion, about $1,000 for every man, woman, and child in the United States. By 1977, when I graduated from high school, the ratio had increased to $3,000 per person. But by 2014, the S&P market cap hit $19 trillion, or nearly $60,000 per person in the United States. Global capital has tripled since 1990 to some $600 trillion, 10 times the value of global GDP, 
and it is expected to increase another 50% by 2020, despite weakness in the underlying economy. But equally important, during the same period of time that capital grew exponentially, new technologies have simultaneously and dramatically decreased, reduced the importance of capital throughout the most dynamic segments of our economy. For example, it once cost, once cost billions to finance a new steel mill, the symbol of the old economy, but I was the first non-family investor in Amazon.com. We raised just $1 million. Google's first round of financing, just $25 million. As a professional investor and venture capitalist, I can tell you there is zero shortage of capital available for great people with great ideas. Capital is simply no longer the principal constraint on growth. If you want more proof of this capital glut, consider the fact that Americans, America's corporations have been investing their record profits not in plants and equipment and expansion, but in manipulating the price of their stock through, through, through more than $6.9 trillion worth of stock buybacks over the last 10 years alone. $700 billion, or 4% of GDP just last year. Let me say that again. This year, our nation will, will spend 4% of GDP just on stock buybacks. This proves that not even an infinite supply of capital can incentivize a CEO to hire more workers, absent demand for the products and services they produce. In this era of capital superabundance, an era in which capitalists like me already have more money than we know what to do with, attempting to grow the economy by making rich people richer is like attempting to make the ocean wetter by adding more water. So if our 21st century technological economy has advanced past the stage where concentrated capital is the dominant driver and enabler of growth, where does growth and prosperity actually come from today? The answer turns out to be far simpler than one might imagine. Growth, it turns out, comes from inclusion. In the technological economy of the 21st century, growth and prosperity are created by a virtuous cycle between innovation and demand, not by capital accumulation. Innovation is the mechanism by which we solve all human problems, and consumer demand is the mechanism through which markets distribute and incentivize innovation. And it is social, political, and economic inclusion, the full, robust participation of as many people as possible that drives both innovation and demand. Consider first the essential contribution of innovation. Life isn't dramatically better today than it was in 1800 because we are allocating 19th century resources like horses and carriages more efficiently. Life is better today because we have effectively created motorized transport, life-saving antibiotics, indoor plumbing, the internet, and many other innovations. Product innovations do not merely lead to more economic output, but crucially, to better outcomes, to actual improvements in the lived experience of people. GDP, our present measure of growth, is simply a measure of output and thus is a horrible and misleading measure of growth <laughs> because it cannot capture what is happening in people's actual lives. If economic growth is to have any real common sense meaning, it must be measured by the degree to which the life of the typical family is made better over time and at what rate of improvement. Innovation is the way we improve people's lives, and a robust market economy is the key to maximizing the rate of innovation. Market economies are all about specialization. The more people we include in a market economy, the more people are free to specialize. And the more specialized skill a society can accumulate, the more knowledge it creates. And it is through an evolutionary recombination of new knowledge and novel ways that between ever-increasing numbers of diverse specialists, that society develops the social and technological innovations that solve all human problems. And crucially, and this is worth underscoring, the more diverse the participants we fully include in our economy, the more diverse our approach to problem solving will be, resulting in a faster rate of innovation and economic growth. The science is clear. Diversity does not hinder growth. It supercharges it. Economic vitality is driven by differences, not sameness. 
Indeed, it is this ability to tolerate and leverage differences that is America's greatest global competitive advantage. Thank you. We have the most diverse and therefore the most creative and innovative workforce on the planet. Inclusion drives innovation and more innovation, the, better, the more and better the solutions made available to us, but innovation and entrepreneurship without robust demand for the products it produces cannot happen. It's like the sound of one hand clapping. That is why we must also incentivize innovation by including as many people as possible as robust consumers. A high growth economy requires policies that ensure robust and growing consumer demand from America's middle class. This is why raising wages and other middle out policies are indispensable to growth and why accumulating capital in the hands of corporations and the wealthy is not. Once again, when workers have more money, businesses have more customers, and when businesses have more customers, they hire more workers. The trickle down theory, the one that fetishizes capital accumulation, holds that a thriving middle class is a consequence of growth and that only if and when we have growth can we afford to include more people in that economy? But the middle out theory, the one that focuses on the accumulation of human capital, tells us that trickle down has cause and effect exactly backwards. What, that a thriving middle class is actually the primary cause and source of growth in a modern technological economy. And that inclusive policies are the mechanism that allow the middle class to thrive to thrive. This is why our challenge must be to overthrow the failed trickle-down paradigm and replace it with a modern theory that understands that in an economy driven by innovation and demand, inclusive policies, policies that are intrinsically just and fair, are the only effective approach to actually growing the economy. On April 1st, Seattle will take the first small step towards demonstrating the power of in economic inclusion and the right-wing media and the most short-sighted business interests are howling. Not because they fear that 15 will fail and harm the economy, but because they are secretly convinced that it will succeed and help the economy. And by so doing, destroy an economic theory designed for and benefiting only them. And on this one point, the trickle-down crowd is right, it will. Thank you.